In the speech from the throne last week, the federal government signaled its intention to go after what it called web giants. Citing undue influence over our media and culture, Ottawa seems poised to bring in both regulation and taxation. With us for the lay of that landscape, in Montreal, Quebec, we welcome Fenwick McKelvey. He's an associate professor of communication studies at Concordia University. And Professor McKelvey, it's good to have you on our airwaves tonight. Um, how are you managing through this pandemic? Let's just start there. It's, it's interesting times. And uh, so far, the kids aren't actually going to burst in because they're both in, in daycare right now. So that's a plus. <laughs> Your kid's in daycare, but, but no students on campus, right? No students on campus right now. No, we're all virtual for the fall and winter. Huh. Okay. That, that's a shame. Let me, um, let me read something from the throne speech here, and then we'll get you to react to it. Web giants are taking Canadians' money while imposing their own priorities. Things must change and will change. The government will act to ensure their revenue is shared more fairly with our creators and media, and will also require them to contribute to the creation, production, and distribution of our stories on screen, in lyrics, in music, and in writing. Now that's throne speech ease, and I need someone to translate that for us, so that's what you're here for. What does all that mean exactly? I'll do my best. Throne speech ease is this particular dialect. Um, I think you can think that the government has a lot on its plate right now when it comes to large social media platforms and keeping that in a basket of what, we, what those means is kind of unclear. Um, and what the government is kind of signaling is that one, they're trying to move forward on, on reforms to taxation, and two, it seems like reforms to how they're going to get companies to provide revenue back to some Canadian creators. And that's part of a bigger reg, uh, legislative reform. Do you support that approach? I have hopes and aspirations that there would have been more discussion about what the government had previously signaled. It's been talking about reforms to the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Act, as well as reforms to both privacy and data. So there's a lot on the table before this speech was made. And it seems like this is a fairly narrow ask that they're putting forward, and it remains to be seen what that what that even means. Well, yeah, this is definitely not that, that big, broader picture from 30,000 feet. This is a much more narrowly focused ask. And, f you know, for example, the government is saying Google and Facebook are avoiding taxes right now. Uh, you know, they operate in Canada, but they don't pay Canadian taxes. Is that a fair characterization in your view? I think the taxation issue is complicated and I think fits into a bigger picture, which is how foreign companies operating in other markets pay taxes. And I think that global tax avoidance, as we know from the Panama Papers, is a big issue. Canada participates in it as much as it is, you know, suffers from it. And so I think I support efforts to reform taxation, uh, corporate taxation, such that companies that, are, that have accountability, fiscal accountability in the companies that, countries they operate. If you wanted to tax them, how could you actually do it? Well, that, that, there you can start getting in some options. So you can think that there's, I think, four options on the table. And so going from, I think, easiest to, to most difficult. The first is something like getting them to pay the GST and the HST. And it seems some companies do it in Quebec here. Uh, Netflix and platforms are responsible for paying and collecting the sales tax. And it's unevenly done. But you can think that the first thing would be platforms would be collecting GST and giving that revenue back for some of the sales on the platform. And that does happen on some platforms and doesn't on others. Second one would be this matter of income tax and whether they'd actually pay for the revenues or, or give back corporate taxation on the income they're generating in Canada. And that's a trickier one that requires a lot more global coordination, but certainly I think is one that's promising. The minister has then also signaled something to the effect of bringing in a data tax, which I know little about, but you could think that that might be trying to create, you know, create or increase the cost of collecting lots of data. And then finally, what has been done in Canada, which is unique, is that a lot of creators like radio stations, like broadcasters, give back to funds to support distribution. And so when I read the throne speech, it seems like what they're saying is they want to deal with some of these taxation issues, as well as making sure or perpetuating some of these boutique taxation programs uh, to fund Canadian production. Now, if, I mean, let's just take Google or Facebook, for example. These are free services uh, to the people who use them. If you suddenly start taxing these companies, is there any likelihood or possibility that these companies might somehow charge user fees to their users? Uh, that's a good question. And there's debates about whether that's a good or bad thing. Um, you can certainly think that a lot of these companies operate on 
providing universal access so that anybody can use these platforms and have an email or have access to Facebook. Um, but that comes with a lot of cost in terms of the data collection and advertising. And these, I think, raise real social concerns and harms. And so the question is, how do you opt out? And so maybe if you paid a monthly fee, you would be able to exempt yourself from the, um, I think, deeply problematic data collection that's taking place in these platforms. So if it forces their hands to offer that service, which a lot of people have called for, that may be beneficial. If, for example, and I'll just take one of those four options that you just laid out, if the government, let's say, put a 3% tax on income, uh, on the revenues of the web giants from Canadian sources, does anybody have any idea how much money that would realize for the federal treasury? Uh, yeah, there are numbers there. I mean, I was seeing reports that, you know, Facebook collected about, um, you, know, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in Canada. I don't know the exact figure in front of me. Um, so there could be a way that this would actually generate and add to the coffers. I mean, these are profitable com companies and that the online advertising industry, which is a small part of the global media ecosystem or Canadian media ecosystem, um, is largely run by Google and Facebook. And I think more accountability and more, uh, you know, though that, that pivot to online advertising is making sure that taxation is going back into Canadian coffers would be beneficial. So we're talking real money here. This is not just annoyance money. This is, this is real this is big time dollars for the treasury potentially. I think parts of it, yeah. I, if you're if you're really looking at the online advertising aspect of it, and if they are actually going after income generated in Canada, there could be some real money. Okay, let's do a compare and contrast here. We know how profitable these companies are that we're talking about right now, but I want to compare them to the legacy media. Uh, take your pick, you know, Post Media, Torstar, City TV, conventional television, conventional radio. You know, we know legacy media have been having just a devil of a time of it over the past decade, and then COVID hit. Can you update us on to how you see the health uh, of legacy media right now? Well, legacy media is a big word. And what, do you, what legacy media are we talking about? Are we talking about newspapers? Well, they've been on the ropes, and uh, there's a lot of debate about what's causing their decline. And so I certainly think that we see journalism suffering, um, there's more debate about when you talk about other aspects, when we talk about creators, you know, large conglomerates in Canada, Bell, TELUS, Rogers. I mean, certainly those companies seem healthy and that they are able to make large acquisitions and they're mobile and they're able to kind of offset some of these fees. So I think that as much as we kind of emphasize this alarmism, you know, what we're not talking about here is necessarily journalists. We're not talking about creators here. We're talking about companies that then hire those creators. And I think that that sometimes gets lost in the mix here. And it's a difficult time to be a creator online. It's a difficult time to be a journalist online. And a lot of the reasons it's hard to be a journalist or a creator online has to do with the companies in Canada that are complaining about their, their, their revenue. Well, if the federal government did, in fact, put some kind of tax on these um, online companies, do you think that legacy media would interpret that as a potential lifeline for them? I think it would help, yeah. I think that legacy media... You know, and you're thinking about, I think newspapers in particular are really trying to fix what is, I, I admit, a very difficult problem about how to get revenue and get subscribers back. And I don't think that it's necessarily possible to fix it and go back to the way it was. And so I think that for companies that don't have a clear path forward, government support is helpful. And I think that, you know, if we can separate the economic value that these companies are creating with often what the rhetoric is about, which is about their function in a democracy and for cultivating a healthy democratic culture. What we really want to be focusing on is how to ensure that these companies are able to create those things which we think as a society are beneficial. And that might be just more direct subsidies in general. Hmm. Now, I don't want to be precious about this because uh, obviously a number of people have looked at what the online companies are doing. You know, the fangs, I guess they call them, Facebook and Netflix and Google and so on. Uh, you, they see them operating in what they consider to be their own self-interest without regard to what they might be contributing to Canada. Do we, do we take the next step and infer that the media giants, the legacy media giants in this country are acting in the public interest? Do you think they are? Yeah, I, so I think that the, the, the problem for someone like me is that I think that Canadian media should act in the public interest. And I see both evidence on both sides both on the large social media platforms and the legacy giants of, of neglecting that. And so what I think is often wrapped up is this idea of creating CanCon, which I think vacillates between being something which is economically successful 
and you know something at winning and for export markets versus creating stories that are important for Canadians to understand how they participate in our society. And I think the the latter gets mixed together lots. And I think what we really want to see is how we have a path forward that ensures that public interest of the media is kept and cultivated. And I think that that's the thing that's missing to me. Well, I wonder if that path forward includes some kind of, um, you know, international cooperation on this. Presumably, if Canada acts alone, it won't have nearly the heft that it might have if it were to coordinate its efforts with other countries around the world. Is that an option that's being pursued? So it depends. So when you were talking about how to deal with these large platforms, there's so many different issues to deal with. Are we dealing, talking about disinformation? Are we talking about taxation? Are we talking about how people see the news? Are we talking about the way creators are able to make money on their platforms? And so there's coordination in some areas around disinformation. You know, we don't see that same level of coordination about necessarily algorithmic accountability or the ways that the platforms are treating the news. And so, you know, conceivably the next step would be Canada to coordinate with partners to ensure that they have, I think, the influence needed. But even then, you have Mark Zuckerberg unable to enter Canada because he'd be compelled to testify before Parliament because of uh, his lack of participation in the Grand Committee. You know, there have been efforts to bring these countries, these companies to account in smaller markets like Canada, and we haven't had a lot of success. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember. He did testify before Congress in Washington, but but when offered the chance to do so on Parliament Hill, he declined. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't want to also single out Facebook because they are doing a bunch of other initiatives in Canada. But there is, I think, real doubts about what is the regulatory bandwidth that Canada has and how much if the government wants to take a leadership role, it's capable of doing that. Um, because it really means that it's starting to take power away from some of these companies. And we don't know what that's going to look like. Well, let's take a look at another example a uh, long way away, Australia. Australia, the government of Australia has tried to kind of uh, enter this field and they went for, uh, I guess, a potential confrontational taxation approach. What was the reaction there? Well, that is interesting because looking over the report, I mean, there's a number of over, you know, 16 recommendations that the Australian government is putting forward. So it's all to say it's a very interesting document. And I think there's a lot of recommendations that Australia is putting forward that really does demand more attention in Canada. So I don't want to shortchange what Australia is up to. What it's attracted a lot of attention is they want to ensure that if links or content are being shared from news outlets on social media platforms, there's a fair exchange of revenue. And so this gets into things that have also happened in the EU, where you're talking about link taxes or having it so that websites that are sharing that content might ultimately be responsible for giving back some of the revenue they're getting. And it's a bit of a mess, and the Australian government finds itself in the middle of news outlets and the large social media platforms. Right. I mean, they're not, well, I mean, Facebook fought back, right? What did they, what did they have to say about this? Well, a lot of them are threatening to exit the market, and in Spain that's happened. Google News uh, doesn't operate in Spain because of similar government initiatives. And so I think the, the big question that Canada and many other countries need to be looking at is, like, how much regulation can they get away with before the companies ultimately say, well, this isn't worth us participating? This happened before in Canada. Google decided to exit uh, faced with more regulation on election advertising. Uh, Facebook didn't and participated. So I think you can think that it's uneven and it's unclear. And that's only two of what we call the web giants. And um, it's hard to know whether we're talking specifically about you know, Google, Facebook, the gaffers or the fangs, or we're talking about a larger ecosystem, which I think is important to consider when we're, we're, if we're talking about protecting creators. It's not just, those, it's not just the two main ones that are um, in that mix. No, for sure. And, and uh, I mean, again, with the Australian example, if, um, if Facebook decides to go to DEF CON 1, and they say, okay, Australia, you want to regulate us, you want to tax us, we're going to block all Australian news from our platforms. I mean, you can imagine how the Australian news media would react to that, how the, the uh, you know, media companies would react to that. So, um, you know, if that's, if that's potentially what's ahead for Canada, how do we have to play this? Well, I think there's a question about how much online advertising is worth for some of these companies. And I think that's actually a really big question. I mean, so what's the hit they're going to take? And I think the second part is that what are Canadians doing if they're sharing the news? I mean, they're talking about it, they're discussing it, they're doing all those functions that we want to cultivate. And so I think that there's, you know, another question about, you know, what are the discussions that are taking place in these platforms and are they the healthy ones that we want to encourage for democracy?
So the path forward, I think, for Canada is trying to consider whether or not this is the right approach. So this this one narrow part of this big, big issue, is that the hill you're going to die on? Or is it something more broader in terms of reforms? And then second, it's try to, how do you focus on making sure that the news outlets as well as social media platforms are coordinating uh, to make sure that there's healthy conversations that are helping Canadian democracy? Well, as, they, as both sides consider this game of chicken, let me throw some numbers out here, and then, again, I'll get you to react to this. You know, the web giants, they need, they need content, right? They need journalists who are paid by media companies to create content that they basically take and put on their platforms and then use the ads. They target the ads there. At the same time, Google apparently, wow, what a number this is. Google apparently sends people to news sites 24 billion times a month. And at the end of the day, when it comes to news outlets and web companies, who needs whom more? Oh, I think that it's the, the news outlets need web companies way more. I mean, you know, the numbers you're giving there, you think about, I think what's the big issue here is, is what are people doing? If you've got a phone in front of you, do you want to sit there and read all this depressing news about COVID-19 or watch your, you know, your friend and your influencer on Instagram? And I think there's a lot more competition for content now. You can do so much. Why spend it? watching and reading the news. And that's a big, I think it's a deep question. That's an important question. I'm not trying to belittle it. But if you think about it, platforms have become, you know, really beneficial of taking all this demand to be creators and all this demand to make content and figure out a way to monetize it, even if that's not profitable to the people who are creating it. So the news is just one revenue outlet. And I'd be curious about how many people go to other websites or YouTube when they're going to watch content. You know, those are massively popular platforms. No, for sure. But can you imagine a scenario where, you know, these two sides, the government of Canada and, uh, you know, any one of the fangs, can you imagine a scenario whereby a, face, a Facebook or Google says, you know what, government of Canada, we don't like your taxes, we don't like your regulation, bye-bye Canada. We're just not going to play in Canada anymore. Can you imagine that happening? Uh, you know, I think that that would be a, 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 a real risk. But it hasn't, you know, but it has happened in Spain. So I mean, I think it's a it's a legitimate risk. I would be very surprised if they did it because it is like a nuclear option, and it really would taint, I think, their legitimacy if they can't play ball with a country like Canada. I mean, at the same time, you know, if we're really talking about trying to fix the news industry, is it this link text that's going to be the fix? I think that that's what I think is misplaced. You know, in the Australia report, they talk about better subsidies for Australia, uh, for public media. We know the same thing in Canada. Canadians pay the lowest, uh, you know, per capita amount for public broadcasting. You know, it's very low. How can we raise that up? If we are concerned about the news, what are the ways that we can actually bolster up the news industry? But I think it requires us to think differently and not try to think that the way or the fix for the news content is, you know, something with online advertising you know, or I think something's the effect of this this link sharing arrangement. Hmm. Now, we've been talking overwhelmingly about the taxation and revenue side of this argument, but but let's also talk about the other side of it, which was mentioned in the throne speech, which is uh, the government wanting web giants to, quote, contribute to the creation, production, and distribution of Canadian content. What did you take to mean from that? So that, I think, is particularly about the trying to have it so that companies that are um, creating music and television or television-like content contribute back to funds that support artists like Factor um, or the Canadian Media Fund to create that content. And that's been a huge debate for 10 years now. And I'll be curious to know how they play that out because they haven't, even despite there's been a number of attempts to fix that problem, nothing's worked. Now, depending on who you talk to, there's either some or a lot of that already going on. You know, Rogers TV has its fund, Bell has a fund, uh, Netflix has a fund in which it spends uh, considerable sums on Canadian production. Is this not happening already? Well, it already happens for Canadian companies. So Canadian companies are, there's a healthy system that is, I think, you know, problematically concentrated in a few companies, but there's a healthy system which is supporting Canadian production. And the question is, how do you integrate a company like Spotify into that mix? And that, I think, gets into a really nuanced question about whether it's about general revenues to support artists and creators or the system which we have now, which is, um, depending on how much revenue you get, there's a responsibility to give back. Should it be about 
Well, I should just ask you, who should this be about at the end of the day? There's a long list here. There's Canadian companies, there's the web organizations, there's the consumer at the end of the day, there's the content creators. Who deserves the priority attention here? Well, I think the two problems that we have now is that the creators that we talk about, you know, what this conversation is about is people who make TV shows. And we have all kinds of hosts of new Canadians that are trying to create content on YouTube or become streamers on Twitch that face really poor working conditions. Uh, the average amount of revenue that a YouTube creator makes in Canada is about $10,000. These aren't sustainable. So we're looking at a generation of creators that are working in very precarious conditions that are really just dealing with this one-on-one -on -one relationship with companies like YouTube that are all cultivating their own star system. So they're creating these markets and they're playing in them. And so I think really, to me, the fundamental part is how do you support creators? How do you create those, you know, how those creators include journalists and musicians? How do you support them? And what are the ways? And, and I think that the challenges we've seen a lot of initiatives really focus on targeting some of these legacy companies, which are only capturing a small market of when we talk about Canadian content. Understood. Fenwick McKelvey, Associate Professor of Communication Studies, Concordia University. It's good of you to join us on the line from Montreal tonight. Thanks so much. My pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.